Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan and Mr Pitts. This is Ukraine War News Updates Part 2 for the 30th of July 2023. I'll make this a little bit quicker than the last video. I had that big Starlink piece on it. So anyway, we'll go to the front line as we normally do and we're going to go up to the northeast sector around the Svatova area between Kupiansk and Kremina. Here, the Ukraine, if you remember, the Ukrainians were put under a lot of pressure as the Russians made some really quick advances over a couple of days. West of the Zherebets River that comes down here up towards these heights, this ridge line here, and then on towards the Oskil River there. So they made, I don't know, anywhere between sort of three and five kilometers, maybe advances. And then subsequently, they've been pushed back as Ukraine seemed to have uh, stabilized that sector. And that is what here, for example, Euromaidan Press is saying. Frontline report, Ukrainian forces secure control over the village of Nadia in Luhansk. So there were claims about this village that the Russians had taken it, then the Ukrainians had retaken it or the Russians had at least left it uh, and it seems that the Ukrainians have certainly well as according to some sources retaken it and advance on Nova Herivka forcing Russian troops to abandon their positions there. Syriac maps a pro-Russian map has said situation in Luhansk front despite the initial advances the arrival of new Ukrainian forces managed to stabilize the front line moreover Ukrainian army re-entered uh, the small village of Tverdok Kibove. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, it uh, the Russian army didn't stop offensive operations and troops made minimal advances uh, south of Neharivka. So there, there are claims that the Russians are still uh, trying to advance or successfully advance in maybe in tiny places, but essentially Ukrainians have stabilized and retaken some, some territory there. Um, and Ukraine, it says the Russians still are trying to enter the Kharkiv Oblast from this side. So Kharkiv Oblast is to the west of this Luhansk Oblast border there. So around this area, uh, possibly the uh, just west of Karmenzi and Ivka, the Russians are still pressuring. Uh, and then as we go on into different areas, let's look at, I guess, uh, we have... There's no map of Bakhmut, but there are claims of Bakhmut. There are successes there still, but not a lot coming out. I don't have any mapping at the moment. Uh, so really, we're going to go on down to the southern front line. The claim from Suryat maps in the Staromyorska area that after the Ukrainians took Staromyorska, uh, the Russians launched a counterattack and managed to recapture some of the high and low positions adjacent to Staromyorska, forcing the Ukrainian army to withdraw to the northern part of the town. I don't know that that's wholly true. I've not really seen that mentioned elsewhere. Uh, in fact, I've seen contrary evidence that, that they're fine and they're kind of securing Staromilsky and actually probing south from there uh, and they're putting a lot of pressure on Urujani. Here we have Ukraine one, being one kilometre away from the settlement of Priyutne. So Priyutne is just sort of to the left of the screen. Um, uh, Zaporizhia Oblast, one square kilometre has been added to the liberator status. No reports says the Ukrainians have advanced towards Priyutne. They're on the outskirts and are pressing the flanks of Burijani. The Ukrainians have reached a road between Novodonetska and uh, Kermenchuk. So Novodonetska is to the right of this screen. Um, indeed, uh, we'll have a look on, a, on the main map in a second. Uh, so that is, uh, in fact, we might be able to make some sense here. So Urijani is there, Novodonetsk is there. So the uh, the Ukrainians might well have advanced in that area. I don't think they're in, in the trouble that Syriac Maps is claiming in the Staromorska area and to the right, to the left, sorry, to the west in Priyutne, uh, they are making some gains there too. So um, that's a situa situation there. Uh, here we have the uh, one source here saying, yes, a Russian said, that the situation of the Ukrainians in Staromilsky was terrible. Now the Ukrainians are preparing to move on. So it, it's like going back against what they were saying. So that, you know, the Syriac maps claim that the situation is bad in, in Staromilsky. After the occupation of Staromilsky, the enemy did not begin to consolidate in order to organize a solid defense there, but eliminated our engineering obstacles in the direction of Urujani. Today, enemy aircraft have already made about seven attacks on this settlement. Electronic warfare is actively working to suppress our communications, that's Russian communications, and artillery preparation is underway. It is obvious that an attempt is being made to break into Urujani. Some time ago, having directed the main blow to Novodonetsk, the enemy almost captured Urujani by exile. I don't quite know what that means, but did not 
uh, have enough perseverance. After that, we increased our presence in the village and in recent days, we have stopped any attempt to attack Orijani head on. By capturing Staromilska, the enemy managed to move to the flank of Orijani, uh, creating a threatening position for our defence. So I would, I, I think, you know, those kind of Russian sources go against maybe what uh, Surat Maps is saying here uh, uh, about that situation but really not a lot else is coming out on on the front lines i mean that is where i'm going to leave it for the moment i am going to do more research obviously and i'll give you a much more robust uh, indication of what's going on on uh, right up and down the front line as far as i can work out from my different mapping sources and so on and so forth so check out that video coming out shortly right let's go on to military aid um, here we have Ukraine's SSO treated us to some new footage of brimstone in action. So what are brimstone? These are well, originally designed as surface to uh, air to air to surface um, missiles. So ground or air launched ground attack missiles, but actually initially air launched. Uh, they've now been adapted to ground attacks, I believe. They're kind of medium range missiles. Uh, so from the from frick, fixed wing they can fire at twenty kilometers. Obviously, that's going to depend a lot on the height of the uh, aircraft. Sixty kilometers uh, for Brimstone Two. I don't know exactly which one the Ukrainians have, but they are ground launched, and we have seen them launched off the back of kind of different vehicles. Like near the beginning of the war, when they had initially been given these, I saw them being launched off the back of basically a truck, like a commercial truck, because they're kind of palletized, so you can just put the system on on kind of anything. But anyway, uh, a salvo of three missiles are seen launched from the back of a flatbed, probably from one of the palletized launchers we saw earlier. Here's a little edit. So th there you go. The brimstones are being used. That, that's going to be useful for the Ukrainians. Uh, German politicians call for the transfer of Taurus long-range cruise missiles to Ukraine. So these are basically... Uh, the equivalent, the German equivalent of the Scalp and the Storm Shadow. So they need loads of these. These are re being really well utilised by the Ukrainians. Delivery to take place immediately. I mean, that's that's the call. That's not to say it is uh, being made immediately, but um, it would be great if Germany does provide those. Uh, slightly off topic, says this uh, source. Two more Leopard 2A4s arrived today at the the Polish Leopard Hub in Gulwitsche. Um, this means that at least four Leopard 2A4s are currently being repaired and maintained in Poland. Nothing is known about the Struv 122 and Leopard 2A6. That's uh, the Swedish uh, version. And Leopard 2A6. This clearly shows how much demand there really is. Um, but also shows that... Uh, yeah, so here, so just to make things clear once again, Leopard 2A Fords are being repaired in Poland by the Polish industry. Sort of 122 and Leopard 2A6 are being repaired in Germany or Lithuania by the German industry. Uh, there's another source, or this one somewhere else says that basically when you count up all the ones that are being repaired, as according to verified Oryx data, that means only three have been destroyed since the beginning of the counterattack, rather than like the Russians have claimed that more leopards have been destroyed than have been provided to Ukraine. So it's part of the course for their kind of disinformation attempts. But uh, yeah, it, it may be the truth is somewhere in the middle. But as far as what we know from verified information, actually, they're not doing too bad for losing leopards, but they haven't really been used. I mean, they're used initially, and they lost a bunch, and then they kind of pulled back and changed tactics. Maybe a few more are just being used at the moment. Uh, not quite sure what's going on on the front line, though, just now after those initial gains from two days ago, but also losses. Right, uh, losses in terms of equipment, gains in terms of territory. Uh, CNN shot a report about a new Ukrainian maritime drone. Journalists claim that it can carry 300 kilograms of explosives and hit targets at a distance of 800 kilometers. Right, this is really good uh, and fantastic potential there. However, it does kind of depend on Starlink. It's interesting that, that this article that I spent all that time talking about in the previous video has, you know, real ramifications, or at least Starlink, has, you know, the use of Starlink has real ramifications on a number of different areas of the Ukrainian armed forces. Obviously, the communication area, in this in this case, it's communication with drones, uh, long-range maritime drones. So here we have um, Special Coastal Combat, 
here saying in early June the Pentagon approved an uh, agreement to purchase four to five hundred Starlink terminals for Ukraine, the settings of which will be in the hands of the US, not Elon Musk. So that is not geofenced Starlinks, which means, for example, Starlink is used in the Ukrainian Magura V5 C drones, claimed range of eight hundred kilometers, which we uh, were recently presented, which were recently presented in Turkey. In theory, this would probably allow similar weapons to be used without worrying that Musk could turn off Starlink access at any time he wishes. It's really significant that A, they've got the defensed or the DG offensed uh, Starlink communication uh, pieces of equipment, terminals. Uh, and it's, it's great because you can then utilize uh, these kind of drones to wreak havoc really far into Russian territory, you know, maritime territory there. So that's four to 500 of those DG offensed terminals being given. And that's really, really important. Zeluzhny, as I said earlier, raised the topic of Starlink. Ukraine's battlefield decisions depended on the continued use of Starlink for communications, Zeluzhny said, and his country wanted to ensure access and discuss how to cover the cost of the service. So that is something going on, uh, still ongoing, one would imagine, and will be ongoing for a long time. They'll just need continued use of Starlinks. They are that important, uh, but but they kind of need unhindered access to the system. Um, right, Wagner Group has likely returned heavy equipment to the Russian army. Uh, Defence HQ has reported, uh, that is the UK intelligence um, report that comes out every day. According to satellite images of the Wagner Group camp in Belarus, most of the visible vehicles of mercenaries are trucks and vans. Few armoured combat vehicles were recorded. And there have been these images of a number of tanks and IFVs and whatnot. In so I, I asked the other day because I showed a whole bunch of these Russian tanks just sitting in a like scrubland. And I was like, what are they doing? Like They're all parked next to each other. What are all these doing? Someone said those are actually Wagner vehicles that are being kind of stored to well, ready to be given back to the Russian mi um, military. So I think that is what has happened. I presume R Russia will get an influx of Wagner heavy equipment that they will be able to use on the front lines. But then that, of course, deprives Wagner of being able to use those going forward. Um, right, geopolitical news. So not a lot really of news on, on any front here. Now, I'm going to show you something which is cool. This is the coolest video you're going to see today. This is just a normal convers political conversation, right, in, in Poland. I like this part of the course. This is a deputy agriculture minister. Uh, this is a, an excerpt of his argument with a dialogue, as it says, in dialogue with farmers' leaders. I think this might be to do with, I don't know for sure, so this might be completely irrelevant. But I think it's to do with the uh, the grain uh, in coming from Ukraine and through Europe and flooding markets with cheap grain and that being a threat to I indigenous farmers. So here, but check out this dialogue; it's brilliant. But apparently, not a single swear word was was exchanged, and they, he keeps called. I think both of them called each other sir or whatever. <laughs> Brilliant. I think both those guys look like they can handle themselves as well. Uh, they're pretty much units. Uh, so that is how you do political discourse in Poland, obviously. Uh, get out of your system, boys. You know, just, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether that's linked to Ukraine fully, but I just felt I had to, I had to just like, imagine that in, in the halls in, in Congress or, or the, in, in the capital, outside the capital or in Westminster in the UK, like a farmer's representative and, and a deputy agriculture minister. Absolutely hammer and tongs. Brilliant. Uh, Polish Prime Minister, speaking of which, uh, says that more than 100 v Wagnerians have gone towards a Suwalki gap connecting Poland with the Baltic states. So this is a gap here. So going to the edge of Belarus, 
Um, according to him, they will be disguised as Belarusian border guards and will help illegal immigrants to enter the country and destabilize the situation in Poland. There is actually genuine uh, worry about the Wagner troops going undercover and getting into to Poland and Lithuania. It's just, yeah, you, they are around that area and... Um, to destabilise the situation in Poland, the uh, Polish Prime Minister called it an unconditional step towards a further hybrid attack on Poland. So watch out for that. There's a lot of talk about that. And the po Polish are really gearing up uh, along the border here with their um, with their own military right up and down the Polish-Belarusian border. And I presume the Lithuanians will be doing the same as well. Uh, Wall Street Journal reports that Saudi Arabia, I'm trying to work out what what's going on here. Saudi Arabia is to host Ukraine peace talks, but without Russia in August and probably without China as well, uh, inviting top officials from 30 countries, the Wall Street Journal reported on July the 29th, citing unnamed diplomats involved in the discussion. Russia won't be attending the summit and China's presence is unlikely, according to the report. Instead, the large scale event aims to consolidate international support for Ukraine's peace demands, the Wall Street Journal said. So this is really really interesting because you've got the Middle East getting involved hosting peace talks but peace talks that aim at consolidating support for Ukraine and achieving what Ukraine would like out of peace talks in an attempt to consolidate support for Ukraine in the global south that's going to be the Middle East but maybe South America maybe Africa maybe Asia at large I don't know really could be really important in the the political chess game involving you know western influence throughout the rest of the world in attempting to garner support for ukraine from nations that, that otherwise are sitting on a fence or uh, you know fairly actively supporting russia and that saudi arabia is hosting that is is i is i don't know it says quite a lot and it's so much to unpick there but anyway, that's that. I might have to go and look at that Wall Street Journal article. Uh, speaking of kind of which, like global influence, here is Maria Zakova, Zakharova, who is, I reported her spreading absolute BS yesterday. as She's continued today in the context of the Russia-Africa conference. Uh, quote, Russian men give their lives at the front so that people from the African continent are free. You absolute what? I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. So let's go through what she says uh, in this little excerpt. Defending the right of the whole world to be free, she says. We're going to attack a nation and thus impinge upon their own freedom, constrain their own freedom by imperialistically invading them uh, because we're fighting for freedom. What? So here she says, two Africans. Uh, sitting there just thinking, uh, you know, think of how Africa has been this colonial f political football uh, throughout history, you know, and, and there's more to come on, on that subject. I'll, I'll let you know in a second. So do you not see that we are fighting, she says? Do you not see that our guys are giving their lives? Well, yeah, both of those things are true. They're not just speaking or performing. But with their lives, they defend not only the rights of the African continent. What? No, they're not. No, they're not. But the right of all people on the planet to be free. They are doing the exact opposite. Like There's a democratic nation, a sovereign nation of, of Ukraine that you guys have invaded so that they can't exercise their democracy. You are fighting against freedom. It's just ridiculous and deeply offensive just jog on uh and then on the propaganda tv channels alexi mukin here so let me remind you africa is more than precious furs but also rare earth metals etc in one sense it's a prize so here you have on the one hand russian uh propagandist as a, as a minister propagandist declaring to African leaders and, and politicians and diplomats, hey, we're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for your right to be free. And literally 
almost at the same time on TV, you got propaganda saying Africa's a prize that we're gonna that we sh- you know should be taking advantage of, and think about Wagner in Africa it, having dipping their fingers into blood diamonds and uh, natural resources. You have got Niger having a coup d'état, uh, trying to throw the shackles of colonial influence from France, but it accepting uh, colonial influence from Russia. It's just like oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, we're all worried about feeding developing nations, uh, says this source. They're talking about mining its resources. And I'm not saying the West are, are um, you know, innocent in terms of exploiting nations uh, and Africa. Absolutely not, right? But this is just double standards coming from directly from Russia. It's just, yeah, pretty offensive. Deputy Chairman of the State Duma, Peter Tolstoy, quote, I am convinced that all countries that used to be in the Russian Empire and then USSR won't be able to exist independent of Russia. They have no history of their own statehood. Again, as I keep saying, they are cherry picking a an era, a point in time. And they say, yeah, no, we're not going to concentrate on what these countries were before the USSR. And we're not going to concentrate on what they are afterwards. In fact, we're going to just claim they can't exist afterwards. It is just the USSR and the Russian Federation is just a new iteration of the USSR. And we claim that Ukraine, for example, any nation that was in the USSR cannot exist as an independent state. What's your rationale for that? Oh, I'm giving no rationale. It's just they can't do it. Just going forward, it's impossible. Yeah, shouldn't we let them try that? Should we see if they can exist? No, 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 no. I mean... We did try that with the UK. Ukraine, we didn't try that. Ukraine tried that. They tried their independence. And you're saying they can't exist independently. But this is a self-fulfilled prophecy because they started to exist independently and you invaded them so that they couldn't exist independently. So in other words, this is you guys, propagandists saying, or no, no a politician saying they can't exist independently. Why not? Because we'll invade them if they do. Okay, right, I understand you. So basically, you're just a big Soviet Union empire again. That's what you want. That's what you're going for, isn't it, Tolstoy? Uh, The EU does not yet have the means to ensure the transit of grain from Ukraine by land, says Reuters. This is uh, a big issue. The grain deal has fallen through. Obviously, Africa, African nations, the African Union have said, uh, we'd like that reinstated, please, uh, Russia. And we're not so interested in your free grain that you're trying to um, bribe us with. Just let's have the grain deal back on. Uh, in, in the meantime, you know, with the Russian kind of pseudo blockade, you, you uh, Ukraine and other nations are looking at exporting grain through taking out the Danube or by rail or by road but that's not yet insured and actually it would be far less efficient and more expensive so ideally you want the grain deal back on but if you are going to do it in other ways that's not yet sorted and there just isn't the capacity to to really do that effectively anyway that's uh, me for the day on news thank you so much please like subscribe and share sorry my first one was a long one take care speak soon